Hey friends, what's up? Welcome to my YouTube channel, Make the World, the world of mechanical engineering contents. Today, we are going to learn new topics of mechanical engineering materials. Let's get started. Today, we are going to discuss about the glasses. So glass is any substance or mixture of substances that has solidified from the liquid state without crystallization. हम लोगों ने सेकेंड यूनिट में पढ़ा था जहाँ पे हम लोगों ने कूलिंग कर्व डायग्राम स्टडी की थी एट दैट पर्टिकुलर पॉइंट वी हैड स्टडी दैट वेन एवर एनी मेटल गेट्स सॉलिडिफाइड फ्रॉम लिक्विड स्टेट टू सॉलिड स्टेट द फर्स्ट थिंग व्हिच हैपन्स विद दैट लिक्विड सब्सटेंस इज दैट इट विल बिगिन मेकिंग क्रिस्टल्स तो दैट प्रोसेस इज called as crystallization small solid particles is known as crystals so whenever we decreases the temperature of the metal which is at a very high temperature or which is in the molten state so whenever we reduces the temperature of a molten metal then first of all it will begin the formation of crystals and this formation is called as crystallization or the formation of crystals is called as crystallization this is what happens with the metals but now here with the glasses scenario is somewhat different glasses will not make or will not perform the crystallization process it will directly get converted from liquid state to solid state okay so the rate of transformation from liquid state to solid state is very much faster in case of glasses glass as ordinarily used refers to materials which is made by fusion of mixtures of silica basic oxides and few other compounds that reacts either with silica or with basic oxides no definite chemical compounds can be identified in glass glass may also be defined as hard brittle transparent or translucent material chiefly compound of silica combined with varying properties of oxides of potassium sodium calcium magnesia iron and other minerals glass is considered as an amorphous substance having a homogeneous texture so in short glass is a hard and brittle material which gives transparent color or if you want to give any color or if you want to add any color in the in that glass it will accept it happen okay it will get mixed with any of the color so by nature glass is very hard and brittle now the point here i want to uh, explain is that process of solidification so i will show you a small picture okay so is it audible now we are self through history yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. okay so the major constituent of glass is silica and silica comes from the sand okay we just recently began to cross over the threshold into the iron age iron is a challenging metal to master its formation and forging into useful tools but there is another material with an older origin than iron this proven to be the long arcane challenge for me for nearly the entire journey of this channel so far glass 2 years ago after several trips outsourcing raw ingredients in lots and lots of experimentation i finally figured out the secrets for making clear glass from scratch this was mostly a challenge of finding the right techniques and modern tools to use combined with sourcing the most effective chemical ingredients but it was still dependent on an electric kiln modern insulation and other tools of today but now with my reset and the change of the scope of the channel the challenge begins anew needing to figure out and replicate how this difficult material was first discovered and mastered 
So let's start this journey all over again. Everything we use comes from 8,000 generations of collective innovation and discovery. But could an average person figure it all out themselves and work their way from the Stone Age to today? That's the question we're exploring. Each week, I try to take the next step forward in human history. My name is Andy, and this is How to Make Everything. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next step in this journey. But first, while on the topic of glass, a word from today's sponsor, of Warby Parker. Featuring one of the amazing innovations that came with the discovery of glass. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores. Offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses. Glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. Sunglasses, progressives, and blue light lenses are also available. Choosing your frames is super easy with our quiz. Just answer a few questions. You can start choosing a set of frames that best fits you. I'm going to try out a few different glasses online, even use their app to try them on on my face. And then got five different pairs sent to me. I'm going to try them on, show them to all my friends, and see what was the best look for me. It ships free and includes a prepaid return shipping label. Their styles range from extra narrow to extra wide, so they can fit pretty much any face shape. Try five pairs of glasses for free at home at warbyparker.com slash HTME. With early evidence dating its discovery, and nearly 5,000 years ago, glass has a long history. My earlier challenges with the material have been mostly about producing optically clear glass, but that was a much later development. Early forms of glass started out much more opaque and cloudy. This type of material is going to be our first milestone. The origins of glass are likely in relation to its accidental discovery, either from ceramics or metalworking. Some early forms of glazes are very similar to glass making and effectively produce a layer of glass on the outside of ceramics, which could have easily evolved into being used alone to make glass. Glass is often also a byproduct of metal production, where impurities in the ore, like sand, can often be turned into a glassy slag. There are, in general, two main components to glass, silica sand and a flux. The flux reduces the melting temperature of the glass it makes the sand easier to melt and work with. Sand is relatively easy to procure, but the flux can be a bit difficult. For an historical flux, we paid a visit to the Gulf of Mexico while in the area and looked for a plant that often served this role. Off the coast of the Gulf of Mexico in Texas and uh, around some of the salt marshes here. And we're looking for a plant called the glass wart or salt wart. It's a plant that grows near salt water and uh, you can burn it and the ashes will produce sodium carbonate, which we use as a flux for making glass. Kind of the way it was originally done before more modern processes were discovered. So see here, it's low tide right now. Water is receded, so most likely along this edge here where its roots are getting saturated at high tide. Nice stick. I make a nice atlatl. Some laundry detergent. This might be it. It looks at least very similar. There's a lot of varieties of salt wort that can be used. Should we be worried about snakes? Probably. For the sign said, it's gators and venomous snakes. So, probably don't do what we're doing. See any gators over there? All right, so I'm relatively sure. Boiled off, a relatively pure sample of soda ash should remain, which can be used in the glass as the flux. Another very useful flux that ended up being a major key for making clear glass in my previous journey is borax, a natural compound we were able to collect in California. Borax has an even lower melting point, which makes the production of glass even easier. While historically borax was available, its use in glass came a lot later. So for my first attempt, I'm going to be using this later knowledge to my advantage, and then attempt to make a more historically accurate version of glass after I first succeed with borax. In my previous experiments, I found a roughly 1 to 1 to 1 ratio of these three ingredients tended to produce the best results. With my glass ingredients ready to melt, the next challenge is getting the right temperature. Ideally, around 2,000 to 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Having just constructed a cob bloomery in our first iron smelting attempt, which happens to operate at roughly the same temperature range, I attempted to repurpose the bloomery and see if we could turn it into a kiln, hopefully able to melt our glass. All 
right, so after doing the iron smelt, we were able to salvage the bloomery and we kind of rebuilt it as more of a kiln. We have a little chamber here with a shelf that opens right up to the coals. Got a crucible here. We have our sand and soda ash mix. I'm gonna just put that in there and put it in proximity because we don't want the actual ash to get inside, otherwise it'll probably discolor our glass and make it mostly black. We don't need to go at quite as hot as steel, but pretty close. I think 2100 degrees Fahrenheit is probably ideal to get everything melted. Uh, directly heated by the coal. I just wanted to cool the directly precursor to the glass. So almost <laughs> the shiny turd. <laughs> glass, but mixed with a lot of impurities. It's a uh, close, but not quite. Using a ceramic brick mold. A mixture of sand and clay as a mortar. I slowly built crucibles and slowly built up the fire and the heat. It's inside the chamber, it's just below 500 degrees. Really good time to start putting in our crucibles and getting them warm enough. Big one. Uh-oh. Alright, so I had the kiln all built and warmed up, fired it a few times, see if the brick mostly fired as much as I could. Now I loaded it up with a couple of crucibles. We just have just a wood fire going right now. We have two crucibles warming up. It's about 500 degrees up here. And eventually, as it slowly gradually warms up, we'll uh, seal it up, get it a little bit hotter, and then we'll switch to charcoal and force air, and I'll get it up to our final melting temperature, around 2,000 degrees. Added additional charcoal as it started to run out, and uh, possibly some sort of efficiency of it, unfortunately. Contain the contents, but just looking at Hard to get out, but let's see if we can get this very cloudy chunk of glass here. Still has a bit of flux in it to be kind of ideal, but glass in this super cool liquid. What is here now? Okay. Suddenly, its temperature decreases. Like we were leaving the metals in the furnace to cool down for 24 hours or for prolonged time. But whereas in case of the glass, we do not require prolonged time. Just in a few minutes or few seconds, it will get cooled down. And because of this rapid cooling, glass will become very hard and brittle in nature. Okay, and this is a natural process. We are not interfering in its glass. cooling process. Okay, naturally it is decreasing its temperature so rapid. Now here, soda ash and limestone is used to uh, reduce the melting point temperature of sand. So, soda ash and limestone will help the sand to uh, become liquidified. Okay. So liquid glass is poured into molds. Again, here, in this particular example, uh, we are going to see the making of bottles, glass bottles. Okay. So for making glass bottles, the technique which has been used or which has been followed is blow molding. Again, in the blow molding process, we require dyes. Okay. It's of required shapes. Annealing. Usually. Look, uh, this, this half portion is a part of a die. And again, this half portion is a part of die. By combining these two half portions, we will get the complete structure like this. As like same, which we had studied in the casting process, same thing is happening over here. Uh, but the difference is that in case of vertical positioning, we are right now we are using horizontal positioning of the dais so as to make the bottles. Okay. We are not limited to make the bottles. We can make any kind of uh, structure, but the only thing required is that we have to make the dies of the desired shape. 
first of all we have to make the dies with the desired shape then only we can make any kind of products or any kind of components with the help of glass How about the solidification of glasses this is how glass solidifies uh, with a very higher pace or with a very higher rate okay so if we talk about the properties of glasses uh, no definite crystalline structure is there in the glasses okay amorphous structure or non crystalline structure uh, is present in the glasses okay no sharp melting point it may get varies okay in some of the cases it will be around uh, 1000 degrees centigrade in some of the cases it will be around uh, 1200 degrees centigrade in some cases it will be around 1400 degrees centigrade depending upon the composition of the soda and limestone is mixed with the sand the higher proportion of Uh, soda and limestone will reduce the melting point temperature and the lower proportion of the soda and lime will increase the melting point temperature of the sand okay so there is no sharp melting point temperature is uh, defined for the glasses it get affected by alkalines it absorbs refracts or transmits light it is extremely brittle it acts as an excellent insulator at elevated temperatures it is not affected by air or water it is not easily attacked by ordinary chemical reagents it can be available in beautiful colors it can be capable of being worked in several ways so these are the some of the important properties of the glasses now what are the different applications of the glasses where we can use the glass so all of you might have know that glasses finds a wide application in day to day life some of them are mentioned over here in glass windows or window glasses plate glasses and container glass electric lamps electron tubes thermometers laboratory apparatus vane screens uh likewise the skylight roofs then fire resisting doors and windows uh, you might have seen this fire resistant doors and windows in railways <clears throat> where it is been written as emergency vent so again this is made with a glass then after that uh, a um, bulletproof glass for glazing bank teller cashier booths jewelry stores again constructing wall partitions rifle bearers then acid resistant cements so in these applications we can use the glasses okay now come to the next point that is glass wool now what is glass wool so this is nothing but your glass wool the usual composition of glass fiber is that of soda lime glass but it may be varied for different purposes glass wool is made by direct melting air or steam jets are used but the condition are such that attention is more violent and hazardous fiber glass wool provides excellent insulation against the heat and cold they have very high tensile strength that is up to 2750 newton per mm square 
shorter fibers are produced in a wider wider range of diameters and these fall on a moving belt such as snow gathers on the ground in this form their natural density is about 24 gra- kilograms per meter cube and they can be used at temperatures up to 500 degree centigrade they may be bonded with a thermosetting resins compressed to the desired density and cured while in the compressed state glass wool differs from mineral wool in that it is a glass made to a definite formulation with a uniformity not found in mineral wool so if you talk about the applications of the glass wool it is used for insulation against heat and cold it is widely used in exterior walls and in the ceiling of homes and other buildings extremely low density wool is used as thermal and sound ins- insulation in airplanes both bounded and unbounded type of glass wool is used in domestic appliances such as furnaces ovens water heaters refrigerators and freezers it is used in electrical industry to insulate wires and cables so in short glass wool is widely used in the areas where extreme weather conditions is present just like european countries and some gulf countries where the outside temperature is either very much high or very much low so in that extreme weather conditions these glass walls are used in the exterior walls or in the ceilings so as to uh, restrict the contact in between the atmospheric air and the air present in the home okay or air present in the room so as to restrict the contact between atmospheric air and air of the room we require a barrier a partition which do not transmits the temperature or heat so glass wool is very much suitable material for that for this purpose and it it is a very much good insulator against heat so you can find such kind of sheets in your ovens refrigerators and water heaters as well a layer of glass wool is pasted in between the two surfaces of either oven refrigerator and water heaters as well as glass wools are also used to reduce the noise it absorbs the noise okay so in this picture you can see that a uh, man is pasting or applying a layer of glass wool in between the two surfaces <clears throat> so this will help to reduce the transmission of heat from one space to another space so majorly this layer or such kind of layer is applied to the exterior walls of the home the wall which comes in the direct contact with the atmospheric air in that wall only we can apply such kind of glass wool layer or the roof which comes directly in contact with the atmospheric air so if we are living on the very top floor of the building so in that case we have to apply a layer of glass wool on the roof okay uh so in which countries most probably this kind of uh, uh glass wool is used in some of the european countries and some of the desert countries it has been majorly used the country like india we do not require such kind of provisions because here weather is not very much extreme in this picture again you can see a layer of glass wool is applied and now it has been covered with the another surface or another layer so this is example of roof again this is example of partition wall okay so likewise a layer <clears throat> mm. 
Then the next type of material is refractory metals. Now what is refractory metals? Refractory metals are widely used in various applications because of their unique and desirable properties and behaviors. Not least of which is their resistance to corrosion. This group of metals also has extraordinary resistance to wear and heat. These metals are mostly used in the field of engineering, science and metallurgy. The five main elements that belongs to this class of metals include the following molybdenum, rhenium, niobium, tungsten, tantalum. So these are the special metals. We can define these metals as the special metals because they possesses the unique or desirable properties or behaviors. Okay. If you talk about the properties of the refractive metals, so all of these five elements are share, uh, elements share a few key point properties as a high level of hardness at room temperature and a high melting point, especially when subjected to temperatures higher than 3600 degree Fahrenheit or 2000 degrees centigrade. So they can withstand the very much high temperature up to 2000 degrees centigrade. So this property makes them different or important or special. Okay. Refractory metals are those metals. In other words, we can iterate it as special metals. The properties present in these metals is unique in its nature. Okay. Such kind of properties is not present in other metals. So this property makes them a special one. So the first property is that they can withstand the highest temperature that is up to 1000 degrees centigrade. Then the next property is these metals have high density and are chemically inert. Next property is the high melting point of these metals give way to powder metallurgy as the choice for manufacturing different components. One major identifying factor of refractive metals is heat resistance. They are strong under extremely high temperatures and are innately hard making these metals perfect for drilling and cutting tools. These metals are highly resistant to factors like thermal shocks. This means that they will not experience cracking, expansion or stress when cooled and heated repeatedly. They have high density levels along with good heat and electrical properties. They are also resistant to creep so they undergo slow deformation when exposed to very stressful environments or conditions this is because these metals have the ability to structure a layer to to structure of to structure a layer of protection making them corrosion resistant so these are the some different properties which uh, defines their applications so refractive metals are perfect for making the cutting tools okay such as drilling and cutting tools as well as uh, because Refractive metals can resist the uh, or withstand the very high temperature. So they can be used in the furnaces or the applications where thermal shocks is produced as well as in some of the electrical applications and uh, heating applications. So the appliances which produces the high temperature or where we require high electrical conductivity in that applications also we can use such kind of refractive metals. So I will just tell you a simple example of tungsten, the tungsten bulb which we used to use in the uh, earlier days. So this kind of bulb we used to use in the earlier days but nowadays it has been totally uh, removed from our day-to-day -day life because it consumes very much electricity which use very high consumption rate of the electricity so nowadays these kind of bulbs are removed from our day-to-day -day life or we are not using such kind of bulbs nowadays but for making these bulbs the metals, the metal, if you can see here, 
on my cursor this metal is made with the help of tungsten material only okay so as soon as we supply the electrical supply to this bulb this tungsten bulb or this tungsten uh, wire is get heated and emits the light in 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 such a manner so the temperature produced over this region is very much higher and tungsten is able to withstand this high temperature and this property makes it a refractory metal or a special metal no other metal can withstand this much high temperature okay so in short refractory metals are those metals which possesses some of the unique properties some of the special properties such kind of metals are called as refractory metals and some of them are listed over here molybdenum rhenium niobium tungsten and tantalum so i have just given a simple example of tungsten so likewise other metals also have some special applications where other alternating metal materials with uh, could not be withstand such uh, heavy conditions or extreme conditions so if we talk about the applications of the refractory materials most con common applications from refractory metal include wire filaments wire filaments this is the example of wire filaments tools chemical vessels within corrosive atmospheres casting model casting molds and more with their very high melting point refractory metals are highly stable other applications are ferrous metallurgy petrochemical applications cement plant applications and incinerators disposal of municipal waste benefits of using refractory metals a super high melting point refractory metals such as tungsten molybdenum and tantalum have very high melting point making them beneficial in glass making so just in the previous point we had discussed about the uh, making of the glasses so in making of the glasses we require to reach 2400 degree centigrade temperature so for reaching that higher temperature of 2400 degree centigrade we require a furnace again the material required to build that furnace it should sustain 20, more than 2400 degrees centigrade okay so in that case we require refractory metals again tungsten molybdenum and tantalum can be used for making such kind of furnaces where very high temperature is been produced next property is that high strength they have standing strength even at ultra high temperatures here the term ultra high temperature is used the temperature which is far more above than the melting point temperature of iron is called as ultra high temperature usually 1450 degree centigrade is considered as the melting point temperature of iron and 2400 degree centigrade is considered as the melting point of glass so 2400 degree centigrade it can be called as ultra high temperature likewise other metals whose melting point temperature is above the melting point temperature of iron can be called as ultra high temperatures so refractory metals can withstand the very high temperature that is ultra high temperatures for instance rocket cones that are made from tungsten have double the tensile strength of iron under normal temperatures so i will show you the example or image of rocket cones so here in this image you can see that ultra cones or rocket cones so these cones goes through the very extreme weather conditions or very extreme conditions okay so at this point 
very high temperature has been produced you can say you can see the flames are getting out from this region or in this image you can see here very high temperature is produced over here so for making such kind of cones tungsten can be used to give the stability or to double the tensile strength of iron okay third point is that outstanding abrasion and wear resistance so the applications where we require high abrasion or wear resistance we can use the refractive metals then excellent corrosion resistance again for making the pipes or in the petrochemical industries or in the pharmaceutical industries again refractive metals are preferred uh, and next point is that thermal shock resistance so where thermal shocks is produced in that case refractive metals are used now what is thermal shocks if you continuously making on and off a bulb then <clears throat> this can produce the thermal shocks okay so with this stand to with this stand this kind of shocks uh, refractive metals should be used so that it can withstand this shocks without any failure then next point is heat and electrical conductions apart from the many electronic and electrical applications refractive metals such as tungsten and all of them are also uh, good as heat sinks extreme hardness so this can be used for making the tools cutting tools and uh, next point is that high density and specific gravity most refractive metals have high density and these can be very useful in making the golf club heads and aircraft gyroscopes then special applications such as uh, ultra useful capabilities such as acting as outstanding radiation shields as well as chemical catalysts so this is all about the different applications or this different special benefits of the refractive metals then uh, types of refractive metals so we are going to discuss this five types of refractive metals in detail now first one is tungsten tungsten is the most abundant among the refractive metals it has the highest melting point and one of the highest metal densities among the refractive metals it can be very hard when combined with other elements like carbon it is also highly resistant to corrosion this metal is widely used in wire filaments such as those in most of the next one is molybdenum molybdenum is the most used refractive metal of all because it is less expensive than most others and when made into an alloy can be very resistant against creep and high temperatures it also does not create amalgams making it corrosion resistant it is mostly used in strengthening steel alloys particularly in structural piping and tubings this metal also has excellent anti friction qualities making it an ideal component of oils and greases used in automobiles then tantalum tantalum is the most resistant against corrosion it is often used in the field of medicines and surgeries as well as in the environments where there is highly acidity is present tantalum is also the major component of computer and phone circuits or capacitors then niobium this metal always comes with another refractive metal tantalum it is highly unique and can be worked on easily to obtain high elasticity and strength it can be used in making electrolytes capacitors and superconductors niobium can also be found in nuclear reactors and vacuum tubes then rhenium Rhenium is the most recently discovered refractive metals it can be found with other metals in ultra low 
concentrations it is also present in other refractive metal ores this metal is known for its high tensile strength and ductility it is widely used in nuclear reactors gyroscopes and other electric components due to its rarity it can be really expensive so if we talk about all these five different types of refractive metals these are quite expensive that is why we find very limited applications or very limited components made with such kind such kind of refractive metals okay so these are really expensive that is why very rarely we, we can see the products made with the help of refractive metals introduction to composite materials composite materials are combinations of two or more different materials combined together to achieve certain properties which they cannot achieve alone so this is the definition of a composite material it is quite similar to the definition of alloys the term alloy is limited with the metals only and the term composite is associated with the non metallic materials okay if we add two or more than two metals together then that mixture is called as alloy whereas if we add two or more non metallic materials then that mixture is called as composite materials okay now the question is why we are adding these materials together either in case of metals or in case of non metals to achieve the certain properties which is not possible with a single material means as all of us knows that chromium has the good property or good wear resistance property whereas tungsten has the property to withstand very high temperature so in some of the applications where we require both of these properties we require good corrosion resistant as well as good uh, thermal resistant in that case what we will do we will just combine these two metals together and will make an alloy so that the component made with this alloy should withstand high temperature as well as should not get eroded or should not get destructed because of the corrosion okay so likewise in the non metallic material also we makes the mixture a combination of two or more non metallic materials so i have given the two different examples of the composites first example is of plywood and second example is of concrete blocks which is used for construction of buildings okay both of these examples comes under the category of composite materials composite material development is a vast field under extensive research further research process is going on on the composite materials so as we can reduce the wastage or waste materials or we can uh, reuse or recycle the waste materials so research is under pro progress on the composite materials usually composites are characterized by low density high strength good impact resistance and high corrosion resistance they can be fabricated easily by number of ways however in few cases the deforming properties of composite is very poor if we talk about the properties of the composite materials the composite materials has high stiffness high specific strength it has high stiffness high specific strength it has elevated temperature strength and high fracture toughness it has resistance to corrosion oxidation electrical and thermal conductivity so these are the some of the unique properties present in the composite materials 
these properties may get varied okay if we change the material so the properties will also get changed if we talk about the applications of the composite materials so so composites are used in aerospace underwater and transport applications where conventional materials cannot fulfill the requirement composites are classified as follows laminated composite and reinforced composites so these are the two different main categories of the composite materials okay so in this image if you can see we have multiple layers in this piece of plywood so such kind of combination of layers is called as laminated this phenomenon of combining multiple layers together is called as laminated okay so all of the plywoods are made with this principle only principle of lamination or laminated okay the thickness of the plywood may get vary it will be available with the different thickness in the market you will find 3 mm plywood you will find 6 mm plywood you will find 9 mm plywood you will find 12 mm plywood in the market but in all of these types the one common thing is that you will find multiple layers which is bonded together so in this image the thickness of the plywood is around 12 mm okay and in this image you will find a plywood whose thickness is around 3 mm but the common thing in these two examples is that either in case of 3 mm thick plywood sheet or 12 mm pl thick plywood sheet you will find multiple layers which is bonded together with the help of glue or a bonding substance okay now these layers are uh, these layers are laminate imparts corrosion resistance electrical and magnetic properties and aesthetic purpose as the surface of base materials they are manufactured by rolling extrusion casting or joining processes cladded aluminum alloy alcad is a typical example of laminated composites laminated composites are used for used as roofing material wall panels doors and window frames thermostats etc so here example given is that example of cladded aluminum alloy is go, given over here this is the image of cladded aluminum alloy so again this comes under the composites basically aluminum cladding is used for exterior purpose to enhance the aesthetics of the exterior of any building aluminum cladding is used for this purpose only so if we see these are nothing but the sheets okay which kind of sheets are these such kind of sheets or such kind of sheets so this cladding provides a smooth or shiny surface which improves the aesthetics of the exterior of the building so aluminum cladding is used in the buildings to improve the looks of the building then next point we are going to discuss is about reinforced composites second type of composite is reinforced composites so earlier also we had discussed about the reinforced composites and uh, that examples can comes under this category cement concrete this is a composite of portland cement fine coarse gravels and water fine sand increases the density while cement act acts as a binder this composites is used in construction it is brittle good in compression and can be hardened at room temperature they may crack 
due to expansion and contraction with the temperature so i will show an image of uh, rcc blocks so these are the rcc blocks which we use for the construction of buildings and these blocks is made up with the sand aggregate cement and water and all of these four elements comes under the non metallic materials and we are joining or combining all these four materials together to make a block which can withstand the high load which is brittle in nature and can be get cracked due to expansion or contraction with the increase in the temperature okay then the second type of these blocks is reinforced concrete reinforced concrete so in this composite steel bars so only difference between cement concrete and reinforced concrete is that steel is not present in case of cement concrete mixture whereas in case of reinforced concrete we use steel bars so if we see the slabs and columns the slabs and columns are called as reinforced cement concrete or rcc whereas the walls which do not contain the steel bars are comes under the cement concrete we will stop over here and uh, we'll continue in the next lecture thanks for watching the video that's it for today i will be back with new and interesting contents in the next video till then take care and goodbye do not forget to hit subscribe button for getting notified when i will be back with new videos